Please stand in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin from the psalm appointed for today, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, my God, hear my voice. Hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my cries for mercy. If you really held us to account, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you. We rejoice in your forgiveness. That is why I wait for you, O God. My soul waits, and in your word I hope. My soul waits for you more than those who watch for the morning, when it seems like the morning will never come. People of God, let us hope in God alone. Let us trust in the steadfast love that created us. We offer our praises to the triune God, who is ready to redeem and is always inviting us into holy presence. Let us worship God with our opening hymn, number 12 in your hymn book, Immortal and Invincible. <laughs> comes 
out of our mouths, but only what is useful for building up. Renew our openness to do your will, and bring us together in the freedom of your grace. Amen. We've made the confession of the church. Let us make the confessions of our own hearts in a time of silence. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, for anyone in Christ, new creation breaks forth. The past is finished and done. Everything is made fresh and new. And in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. For the Lord has vindicated you this day 
delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, is it well with the young man, Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Here ends the reading. those that hear. 
and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another tender hearted forgiving one another as god in christ has forgiven you therefore be imitators of god as beloved children and live in love as christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here ends the reading. Let's stand and sing our praise for hearing God's word. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. Then the Jewish opposition began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written by the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here ends the reading. May God bless us with understanding. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I have to tell you that John is not my favorite of the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell stories about Jesus' life, people that he healed, parables that he taught, 
meals that he ate, journeys that he took. And there's something about the way they tell those stories that makes Jesus relatable, earthly, and real. But John tells the story of Jesus in a different way. In John's gospel, Jesus is more ethereal and less earthly. In John's gospel, Jesus says things like, I am the good shepherd, I am the vine, I am the door, I am the light of the world, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And as we just heard, I am the bread of life, the bread from heaven. Now, I have to admit I've never been very good at understanding poetry. To me, poetry is kind of like a foreign language that I don't know how to translate. And John's Gospel is written in very poetic language. Philosophers have said that poetry happens when words spark the imagination or touch the heart. Poetry happens when someone moves beyond literal, objective observation and tells us something that reaches deep within us to touch our hearts, and sometimes can even change us. Well, John is a poetic writer. He is not so interested in giving us all these objective details about Jesus' life. He really wants to tell us more deeply who Jesus is. He starts his gospel, as you may remember, by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Professor Clayton Schmidt points out that these words spark the imagination and convey a deep understanding of the relationship between Jesus and God and Jesus and us. It is the language of poetry, this language of riddles and metaphors. Well, Jesus also often spoke in this language of riddles and stories. Jesus regularly answered a question with a question, frequently referred to himself in veiled terms that make sense only if you have a bit of poetry in you. In this morning's reading, when Jesus said, I am the bread of life, people were thinking in logical, rational terms. When he said he had come down from heaven, they murmured to one another, grumbling in their literal-minded way, "Uh, don't we know this guy? Wasn't he the son of Mary and Joseph? What does he mean, coming down from heaven? But when Jesus says he is the bread of life, he is saying that he has come to address the primary hunger in humanity. Pastor Philip Martin says it is the hunger caused by our mortality, our fear that God is not with us in our suffering, our fear that our souls will cry out and not be heard by the Lord. But on the cross, that hunger is satisfied. On the cross, we find that God does experience and understand human suffering. On the cross, we find out that God does hear when we cry out. Jesus goes on to say that those who believe in him will have eternal life. And many literal-minded Christians think that means that when we leave this earthly life, when we die, then we have another life, an eternal life. And that's true, but eternal life is more than that. Eternal life is life lived in God's presence. Life lived by God's intention. Life lived in God's way. And that is what we want to do now and what we can do now. Jesus says 
that God is active in the world now. And when he tells us to believe, he is inviting us to see what God is up to. What God is up to in the world now. And Jesus is giving an invitation for us to participate in what God is up to now. He's saying, you are hoping for the kingdom of heaven. And so you think that will happen after you die. But the kingdom of heaven is here now. Whether you participate in it is up to you. But it is already happening. And you are invited to be part of it. That's what it means to have eternal life. Not sometime later, but now. And then into whatever happens next. Jesus spoke in words that were designed to stir the imagination, to touch the heart, to teach more deeply than the head can know. But his words too often fell on the ears of people with no imagination, and so they caused confusion and frustration and even anger. And it is the same today. Many of us hear the words of Jesus and want to analyze them and dissect them. We do not want to be captured by the poetry of the words. As Schmidt points out, faith resides not so much in the head as in the heart. Our faith is nourished in the seat of imagination. Believers know that we walk by faith not by sight. The faithful know that sometimes the best vision comes when our eyes are closed. The richest sounds come in the midst of silence. The deepest understanding comes from believing with our hearts what our minds cannot comprehend. Blaise Pascal famously said, the heart has its reasons, which, which reason knows nothing of. See, faith in Jesus is not something to be measured or calculated. It's not a mathematical equation where so many miracles equals a savior. Faith is not a matter of knowing Jesus' parents or discovering his historical identity. Faith is trusting in the poetry that says Jesus is more than we can wrap our minds around. He is the word that can never be fully spoken. He is bread that may not so much feed our bodies but will eternally nourish our souls. Faith takes imagination. It takes a heart that is open to see what the mind cannot comprehend. In this morning's lesson, Jesus goes on to say that no one can come to him unless they have been drawn by God. One of the hard lessons that the children of Israel had to learn in the wilderness, says Tom Wright, was that God was not at their beck and call. God had not decided to rescue them from Egypt because they were a great nation, more powerful than others. God did not choose them because they were particularly moral. In fact, there was nothing particular about those children of Israel being held in slavery in Egypt. It was simply that it was God's loving choice to make them God's own people so that they would be the nation through whom God's purposes and love would be made known to the world. We remember that as the people had been freed and crossed the Red Sea and were out in the desert traveling through the wilderness, they grumbled against Moses. They provoked God. 
So it's not surprising that in this morning's lesson we find many in the crowd are grumbling against Jesus. They are looking for the kind of Messiah who will give them what they want when they want it. But God does not work that way. God is not at our beck and call, existing just to give us what we want when we want it. Jesus says, in fact, it's the other way around. We come to faith because God has drawn us to God's own self. Not because of anything we have done, but just because God loves us and chooses us. It's another bit of poetry. My clergy friend Steve, who is a writer and a poet, says it this way. Forget all the inspiring images of climbing heroically up the mountain, about noble saints who have made the arduous struggle to come to Jesus. Nobody comes on their own power. We are drawn in. If you want to know about your faith and how it works, sit still for a while. Feel the earth beckon you. Feel gravity holding you in her arms. Earth does not coerce you or threaten you. She just holds you in her thrall, drawing you to her bosom. You cannot claim anything by being held by the earth. You can resist. You can become oblivious at the constant tug at your bones. But you cannot wander far from earth. God does not threaten you with hell. To anyone who yearns to belong to God, damnation is superfluous. Our heavenly lover who is drawn to you, draws you into the arms of love. You do not ascend to faith. You fall into it. Just as you fall in love. Sit still for a while. Open yourself to the holy tug, the divine gravity. Notice what is it that draws you. What is it like the smell of fresh bread that draws you into the kitchen? What leanings and urgings in your soul are the soft speaking of God? What draws you nearer to the mystery? Is it your believing or your doubting? Your certainty or your questions? The world's beauty or its suffering? What draws you? What do you love? Is God hiding there? Sit still. Give time and wait for these longings to name themselves before you. Eventually they all come together. The things that draw you, the presence that allures you, and you know Christ. Let him come to you in all his secret ways. Let God have you, like rain returning to the earth. Let yourself be drawn to God. This is the poetry of faith and the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is number 738 in your hymn book, O oh Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. <laughs>
have taken a few minutes to remember those who are dear to us and let us call them to mind as we bring all of our prayers together. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for the beauty of the earth, its hills and valleys, lakes and streams, mountains and prairies. The great variety of this world reveals to us your grandeur. We give you thanks, O God, for the seasons of life, for beginnings and endings, and for each new day. We give you thanks for love that enlivens us. Thank you for family and friends who know us and care for us. We give you thanks, O God, for Jesus, for his wise teachings, his works of love and healing. In him we see your generous and abundant love. And because of him, we know that we can bring to you all the joys and concerns of our hearts. You have heard the prayers we named out loud. Hear now the prayers for those we know and love, whose needs weigh heavily on our hearts. Hear our prayers for the world, for the nations, the leaders of nations places of turmoil and warfare. We remember especially those in Ukraine and Russia, Israel and Gaza. We pray that you will be with the victims of storms, heat, floods and fire. Be with those who are suffering from the violence of crime, the violence of war, domestic violence and violence of all kinds. Hear our prayers for your church, that we may be open to your spirit and guided by your will. Hear our prayers for those who are struggling with difficulties, for those who are sick, for those in the hospital, for those filled with worries, for those who are mourning, for those who are hungry, for those whose lives are clouded by addiction, or depression, or imprisonment, or loneliness, or despair. We pray for those who are seeking meaningful work, and for businesses seeking hard workers. May all who are in need this day know your transformation by our active care and our participation in your healing presence. Point us, O oh God, toward actions, however small they may seem, that lead to a more hopeful future for ourselves and for your world. Guide our steps to follow in the way of Jesus Christ, and hear us now as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us hear the words of Scripture to be invited to our giving from the book of Leviticus. The Lord said to Moses, One tenth of everything from the land, whether the grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Giving is an act of faith. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God created us in God's own image. So let us give an imitation of God whose giving knows no limits. The offering plates are at the back of the aisles, or you can use the QR code in your bulletin, or you can go to our website, newscotlandpc.org, anytime to make a gift in support of our ministry in this place. We give because we have so much gratitude for the gifts God has given us. So let us stand and sing our praise to God with the words of the doxology.
financial resources, all that we have and all that we are, to live in as imitators of Christ. May our acts of kindness be a fragrant offering to you, O God, and may all of our gifts, our works, and our words be used to further your mission of saving your world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 542 in your hymn book. God be with you till we meet again. We're singing verses 3 and 4. <coughs> Go with the blessing of God, both this day and always. Amen. Mm -hmm.